Great. Thank you, Marty. Nice to see everybody. Thanks for joining online. Um, I'm going to talk about something very different, uh, about a new way to treat cancer. Um, all of us know someone who has been affected by cancer, and um, what we're doing is really taking a new approach to treating cancer non-invasively, without side effects. Um, and it sounds too good to be true, but we've actually got uh, clinical data now in about 30 patients that I will share with you. So I'm going to just pull up some slides here. Um, my, as, by way of background, uh, I'm a biochemist by training, been on the business side of biotech uh, just shy of 25 years. I've uh, been CEO of a number of venture-backed biotech companies uh, with uh, premier uh, VC groups like Third Rock Ventures and Fidelity and others. Uh, had one had Third Rock Ventures' first solo exit, uh, which was maybe one of the shortest exits in biotech. We were in business only 20 months uh, for that company called Lotus Tissue Repair, and you can Google it. So what I'm going to do today is talk about sonodynamic therapy. It's something you probably haven't heard of, uh, but it's a totally new way to think about cancer treatment. Uh, there was a fantastic New York Times uh, bestseller book called the first cell that sort of bemoans the fact that since Nixon declared war on cancer in 1971, we haven't really made that many great advances. Right? There's been radiation, chemotherapy, uh, and lately antibody drugs. I was involved with the company in the early 2000s. That uh, there are many antibodies on the market today that have really changed cancer. But the common themes of these treatments, radiation, chemotherapy, antibody drugs, more recently, something called CAR T therapy, which is a way of getting the body's immune system to attack cancer, all have significant side effects. We all know about chemo side effects, for example. And what I'm going to share with you is a really new way to treat cancer uh, that's not surgical and doesn't have the side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. I'm not going to go through my team uh, in detail here, but uh, the, the, the team is really um, very experienced one, people who've developed many drug device combinations. What we're developing is a drug device combination. Uh, but we've got people who've been in the business uh, 20, 30 years, uh, have really strong ties with uh, the folks in the industry, with the FDA and so on. And more importantly, have taken drugs all the way to FDA approval, have taken devices all the way to FDA approval. You know, while the financial exits have been really fantastic, the real reward for us as drug developers is getting drugs on the market. Uh, I've had the privilege of having two FDA-approved drugs uh, with uh, teams I've worked with previously, and they have changed people's lives. Uh, my background's really been in very rare diseases, uh, what are called orphan diseases, because nobody works on them. And that's a common theme in my team over here. Um, Can I just ask you to give a little bit of a description of Stuart Marcus, because he seems to be a pretty important person in the space? Yeah. So the, the uh, two people I've focused on my team side are Stu Marcus, who is a biochemist like myself, but also a medical oncologist. Uh, started out at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. But he's been a pioneer of what's called photodynamic therapy. Some of you may have actually been treated with the device he developed, uh, which is a blue light that activates the drug to kill skin cancer cells without affecting normal cells. And this is a, that was a drug device combination. Uh, he's had two others to his credit, as have others on the team. And this was his idea, the idea that you can treat cancer non-invasively, kill only the tumor cells, but leave normal tissue unaffected. Uh, so I've been working with Stu uh, since 2017 uh, at two other companies, and we formed Sonalysense in 2019. Uh, the other person I want to highlight is Eli Benane, who's our chief medical officer. He was at St. Jude for many years, uh, leading the transplant unit. So he's a hematologist, and you see why that's important. He's also had a lot of experience in brain cancer. He was the chief medical officer of a public company called Novacure. That's been quite successful. We've got a great scientific advisory board uh, on the right side, and I'm not going to go into it, but it's comprised of uh, leaders, uh, and key opinion leaders, in brain tumors, uh, tumors of uh, the abdomen, uh, like pancreatic and bladder cancer, um, as well as uh, industry uh, uh, representatives. So what we're doing is, is really pioneering a way to treat cancer without side effects. Uh, it's a drug device combination. The device provides ultrasound, 
And the ultrasound itself is a much lower energy than what's used in pregnancy to image a fetus. So by itself, the drug does nothing. By itself, the ultrasound does nothing. But it's really the combination that kills tumor cells. And there's no surgery, no chemo, no radiation involved, and really no side effects in the 30 patients we've treated today. Um, our, uh, we've got a strong intellectual property position on this drug device combination and, and very specifically on the ultrasound parameters that are needed to kill tumors. I'm going to focus really on one of our programs today, which is a pediatric brain tumor where we've seen some pretty spectacular results. And as Marty was saying, I'll show you a couple of videos that uh, I think are pretty self evident. The goal here is to start in this rare pediatric brain cancer, get to an FDA approval, and then expand into other cancers of the blood um, and also cancers of uh, the bladder, pancreas, and so on. So what I want to share with you is, uh, this is maybe a, a very busy slide, but I think I just want to illustrate a couple points here. Our drug is a nutrient that all of us make. Everyone here makes about 300 milligrams of it every day. It's called ALA, or amino valenzinic acid. And we need ALA to make something called heme, heme like an hemoglobin. So it's, think of it as a nutrient, okay? What the ultrasound does is it converts this nutrient into a smart bomb that blows up the cancer cell without affecting normal cells. And we currently have three different devices. The device at the top is a device that uses MRI to localize and find brain tumors and then directs the ultrasound beam to, to hit the brain tumor that has taken up our drug and activate a compound that's made from the drug to kill the tumor without affecting normal cells. Uh, we have two clinical trials ongoing, one in this pediatric cancer called DIPG, and the other in a brain tumor that you've probably heard of called glioblastoma that sadly killed Bo Biden and John McCain and Eddie Kennedy. Uh, and we had phase two clinical trials for those uh, diseases. The device you see in the middle is a brand new device that's still at the concept stage, but we just uh, heard that we've been awarded a very large federal grant uh, to support this development. And uh, we won't disclose the agency and so on yet because there's a press release in the works. But uh, the plan is to develop uh, an ultrasound device uh, after the patient receives our drug to treat blood cancers like leukemia uh, and multiple myeloma. And the device at the bottom is a new device we've built and have been working on for about a year to treat bladder cancer and other uh, what are called GI and GU tumors, gastrointestinal and genital urinary tumors. So we really see this as a platform technology, and you'll soon appreciate why. On this slide, these are all different tumors. You don't have to read the names there, but you can see them glowing pink. And the pink stuff that's accumulated only by the tumor, but not by normal cells, is a compound called PP9 or protoporphyrin 9. And that's made only by the tumor and accumulated only by the tumor from our drug. Normal cells don't make this pink stuff. And what ultrasound does is it activates this pink stuff to blow up the tumor without affecting normal cells. And the mechanism is very well understood. Uh, there are several publications from a few different uh, academic labs, as well as from us that show that ultrasound activates the pink stuff you see there to blow up the tumor by creating reactive oxygen species. Is, is PPI the same compound that's used for the skin cancer treatment? Yeah, so Marty's question is, is, is PP9 the same compound used in the skin cancer treatment? And that's exactly right. So the history here is that there's been 30 years of experience with our drug called ALA. And in the past, uh, light was used to activate the same compound that tumors make, this PP9 compound, the pink stuff you saw. Now, you, you can get light to certain places. You know, use your imagination anyway. You can insert a probe, right? So you can irradiate uh, the mouth. You can irradiate the, the bladder. You can irradiate uh, the skin. And you can also put an endoscope down into the esophagus and treat esophageal cancer. And that, that's the history. That's where we, our, our science came from. And Stuart Marcus, who I mentioned, is my co-founder and our chief scientific officer. He's really been the pioneer of PDT, photodynamic therapy. And what we did is we showed that ultrasound actually creates light within tissue. You know, we're about 70% water. And what ultrasound does is it creates light within tissue through a process called sonoluminescence. 
And ultrasound works exactly the same as light to activate the protoporphyrin the pink stuff you saw to kill the tumor without affecting normal cells. I've spared you a lot of the science here. Uh, I could have shown you a lot of animal data as well as uh, human data from our first trial. But what I want to do is really share with you our clinical data in a pediatric brain tumor called DIPG. So DIPG, um, I first learned of this. It actually uh, sadly affected Neil Armstrong's daughter. Um, and she died uh, within a year of diagnosis, as most kids do with this condition. And it's sad to say that the standard of care for the IPG has not changed since 1963, when Neil Armstrong's daughter died of this condition. It affects a part of your brain stem, which is down here, um, called the pons. That's what you see over here. And the pons is a very eloquent region of the brain. It's responsible for breathing and heart rate and balance and blood pressure. So by definition, it's inoperable. It's a very rare disease, as you see, only affects three to 400 uh, uh, people in the US per year, all kids. And sadly, the median survival is only nine months. The current treatment is radiation, and it's high-dose radiation, over, usually over a month. And it really has a profound and debilitating effect on kids. Uh, you can see that graphically in this slide over here, where the left image is the child before treatment with radiation, and the image on the right is treatment uh, post-radiation. We are treating these kids post-radiation. And you can see, if you look closely, that some of these kids are actually paralyzed on one side or the other. This is a common side effect of radiation to the brain. And we're treating them post-radiation because we have to offer standard of care ethically to these kids. And we're seeing remarkable benefits and reversal of some of these side effects um, and, and effects of the disease. The puffiness, by the way, of these kids comes from the high dose of steroids that are used to combat the toxicity of radiation. So we have um, a phase two clinical trial ongoing, and we've already demonstrated we can shrink tumors, we can extend survival in these kids, but really importantly, these kids gain function. And that's because this tumor hijacks the function of normal neurons in the brain. So the idea that if you can kill the tumor, you can restore function of the neurons makes sense. A common theme here is these kids come in, they present with double vision, with headaches, seizures sometimes. And we've shown that we can restore their vision and even uh, in some cases restore crooked smiles from the partial paralysis that they have. We had three luminary clinical trial sites at Children's National Hospital in DC, at UCSF Children's Hospital, and at the Niklaus Children's Hospital in Miami, opening up another four sites. Uh, we've treated nine patients already and completed what's called a dose escalation phase, and we now need to treat another nine patients that we hope we to take to FDA for an accelerated approval. Let me just show you some data here. Actually, it's pretty easy to see even on the small screen. Uh, this was our first patient, uh, she's a five-year-old girl, uh, was diagnosed in May of 2022. Uh, she got radiation, which is standard of care, and we treated her, her a few weeks later, first giving our drug, we injected it, waited about six hours for the tumors to make the pink stuff you saw, and then uh, gave her the MR-guided focus ultrasound. Since this was the first patient ever to get stonodynamic therapy, first child, um, we went really slow, and we only dosed half the pond this side. So this is, you know, her lying on the table, her feet are pointing towards you. So this is the right side of the brain. And this is the left side of the brain. I just mute somebody. Yeah, no worries. I think it's not. So, and what you see is that we see the tumor shrinking pretty dramatically after just one treatment or half and half, one treatment. And she had a pretty amazing quality of life. She, you know, her double vision was reversed. Her smile, her crooked smile went back to normal. But let me just show you a quick video so that you can see, you know, the, the benefit that we had on this job. This is her walking into the airport in DC. And you can see she's holding on for balance. Her right arm is just hanging. She's sort of kicking her right foot forward to, to walk. And just after one treatment, you'll see her, this is about three months later. She loved the ballet. Um, and uh, this is her showing off her dance moves. Um, and you can see that her balance has improved. Her, she can even raise her right arm now a little bit that she couldn't before. Uh, so this was really something that um, 
you know, the parents reported the, you know, these effects to us. Sadly, she passed away because she had metastatic spread of the disease to the meninges lining up her brain, and uh, she, she passed away right at median survival. Uh, we owe a lot to this family for volunteering for our trial. We learned a lot from this trial. And what we learned is that this is, which we knew, a super aggressive tumor. But FDA told us, treat once for safety. We saw no side effects in this child. If anything, she gained function. So then we went back to FDA and said, we're going to amend the protocol to now treating once monthly. And that's what we've been doing ever since. This is the second child. She's our superstar. She was diagnosed in, I think, October of last year, of 2022, treated in November. As I earlier. Again, post-radiation. Here's median survival, about nine months, right? And she's well past that. She's actually just yesterday with a 22 months post-diagnosis. So pretty remarkable. You won't know she has a brain tumor. Uh, I was at a conference and she was doing cartwheels in the lobby. Is there a video? Uh, no, there's no video of her because she's still on trial. Oh, okay. So we're not legally allowed to, to show you that. But uh, she was the star of the conference we were at. Uh, so we've seen this in now multiple patients. I'm just going to cut to the chase here and show you the survival curve. The reason for this is this is what FDA wants when approval. So this is our first child here. We're looking at time from diagnosis. So zero is when they were diagnosed, and these months are when they survived. So this is a child who died, sadly, right at median survival. The dotted line is the median survival from a clinical trial with 43 patients with just radiation and a chemotherapy called temozolomide. And that's median survival. And that has all the side effects of radiation and chemo. And here we are now. This is the most advanced child. The purple triangles are when they are treated. They're not treated once monthly. We had an, another child who got treated a couple times. Um, and then some, like this child, came to us from Israel. Couldn't come back for obvious reasons, but came back recently. You know, and, and, so, and so on. This child sadly passed away right at 12 months. So we'll have a bell curve. And we, but we think that if we start treating patients from the get-go, right after radiation, once monthly, we should be able to see survival that's, that's well beyond the median. So these are patients we treated more recently, and we expect that in May, June timeframe, they'll be beyond median survival. So if we can go to FDA and say, look, here are 18 patients we've treated, and 75% of them survive well beyond the median with no side effects, and we sh we're showing gain of function in these kids. All these kids have, uh, they grew during the trial. Some grew like three or three, three, uh, four centimeters during the trial. They gain weight. Um, the Lansky score refers to performance. 100% means you're as healthy as you can be. Zero is you're dead. Okay, so you can see they came in, the kids that did quite well, have either maintained or exceeded their Lansky scores. This one child who died recently came in pretty ill and you know, decline, and that will happen. But the benefit we're seeing is actually pretty dramatic. I showed you that one video. Here's the second one. This is not a child who's in the trial. This is him during physiotherapy. And you can see he needed support prior to treatment to climb over these little hurdles uh, because he, his balance was really affected. And here he is one month later um, after a single treatment, standing by himself, and there's a little taekwondo kick over there. You don't hear in that video the physiotherapist or his mom screaming, yay! Um, it's, it's really gratifying to see this. So, you know, where we are today is, you know, we, um, we see this proof of concept and this rare brain tumor really as a way to, a, a proof of concept that we plan to expand outside the brain. So this federal funding um, that we announced shortly is to treat blood cancer. It doesn't fund our brain tumor trials but we'll fund uh, trials in these different leukemias that you see on the right. And it's a very small, minimally invasive system uh, that we think can treat uh, the entire blood volume in about 40 minutes. Yeah, so I, I just want to small size. So, so this is, these are, as you said, blood cancers. You're doing hard tumor as well, which is part of the platform. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the uh, compound that you're using has been used in more than 5 million patients already for skin cancer treatment, and it's highly effective. Yeah, so, so the, the drug itself has been around 30 years. It's been approved for a few different cancers. And uh, what we've done is developed an intravenous formulation that has fewer side effects than the oral drug that's approved. But it just speaks to risk, right? If you think about 
uh, risks in, in drug development. It's usually manufacturing, which we have none, because the drug has been made a long time. The devices are easily manufactured. Um, there's no regulatory risk. It's all clinical risk. And we started to de-risk that with our brain tumor trials and now with the blood cancer trials. And, and then this device is for our solid tumor trials, so, starting with the blood. So you have more trials that are ongoing. I think you have some with the Jack Nicholas Hospital or is that the hospital? Yeah. yeah. So that's the, the Nicholas Children's Hospital is the one for this brain tumor. Right. So, and you need to get funding, a $5 million of funding yeah. to be able to do more study. Yeah. And then at some point, if you can come up with 15 to 20 samples, it should get through FDA approval or because I mean, I, I think as an orphan, yeah. disease, it has accelerated approval status or maybe you can. Yeah. So, so let me just get to that. So uh, let me just skip this. We only have about like five yeah. minutes. That's fine. So, yeah. So, you know, here's our strategy here. Sorry, you got your, your other question as well. Yeah, and will this ultimately, you see this as a complete replacement or is it always going to be used in combination with radiation or chemo or? Yeah, so the question is, is this a monotherapy or will it be used in combination? So everything in cancer is a combination. Uh, but uh, for this pediatric cancer, there is there are no treatments. Radiation is used. We hope to, to actually treat patients before radiation one day, just to obviate the side effects of radiation that we saw. Would you see using this like periodically? Like let's yeah. say, you know, it's not necessarily a cure done, yeah. but it's treatment for... Yeah, it's, years and years. it's a once monthly treatment at this point, at least in the pediatric brain tumor. We don't know right now, you know, can we treat once quarterly? You know, right now we just want to just go in and sort of sledgehammer it and, and then we'll refine the dose in regimen as we move forward. But it will depend, what we're finding out is it will depend on different cancers. Like in mm -hmm. that device mm -hmm. I just showed you was for bladder cancer. And right now, the, the type of bladder cancer we're going after, the treatment is to remove the bladder. So if we can prevent surgery to remove your bladder, well, that's the idea. So, so it'll depend. I think in bladder, we may look at combinations with immunotherapy. And I think a lot of analysis on uh, what types of tumors or cancer cells would work the best with this type of therapy? Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually not hypothesis. Uh, there's actually pro proof that any rapidly metabolizing tumor takes up ALA in huge amounts, 50 times more than normal cells. And only the tumor cell accumulates the pink stuff I showed you, the protoporphonides. So there's a long list. Anything with the word carcinoma in it takes up uh, ALA. Leukemias take up ALA. Multiple myeloma takes up ALA. All, all gliomas take up ALA. So is there a specific cancer that you find or a stage of cancer that this would work as far as, uh, as, far as best in or your current uh, clinical trials? Um, what stage are they currently, uh, what stage are they in um, in the performance of your trials? Yeah, so, so right right now, these are all you know, stage three and four, but okay. uh, there's no reason we couldn't read only a day. So, so as, as Marty was saying, just, since I got to wrap up here, is we, we have a, a new way to treat cancer with proof of concept in this pediatric tumor called the IPG. We think we can get to an accelerated approval in 2026. We've got uh, uh, what's called fast-track designation from the FDA, orphan designation from the FDA, and uh, what we're seeking is a way to um, just fill out our convertible note round. We have uh, four left. We already raised 11 out of the 15. Um, and that will um, take us to a Series C financing that's on track to close in Q2. Um, and that will fund us uh, to an NDA filing of the application you need uh, to file for an approval. Will, will investors in this get any kind of optionality into investing in other of your platforms? Yeah. So the question is, you know, will investors get to the option to participate in the broader platform? And yeah, this is invest the, the, all all the assets in the company uh, and the platform are, are 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 within this financing. So the blood cancer is all non dilutively financed. Uh, the bladder cancer, we do some work with it here, but the idea is focus our efforts on the brain tumor indication, and then once we have some sales coming in in 2026, broaden the platform into other solid tumors. You received $62 million in this new grant. Have you received other grants in the past, at the NIH? Yeah, so, so we've actually uh, already received about 10 million previously uh, from uh, the National Cancer Institute, the FDA, and the IV Foundation. Uh, and it, with this latest grant, uh, the first tranche is 12 million. Uh, that funds some preclinical work, and then the other 50 will fund the clinical trial. 
and how much investment has been made so far? Not yeah. So diluted equity, uh, we uh, had 25 million in two price rounds and 10, about 11 million under the convertible notes so far. And what's the valuation you're coming in at? Or you don't, you haven't priced it yet? Well, we haven't priced it what yet. What was the last like? The, the last round, the Series B valuation was 147 million, which is on par for a phase two uh, company in cancer, maybe a bit lower. And you've received 75 million dollars of grants now, so, so yeah, that, that, that helps. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Well, fantastic. You know, um, great job.